All right, kia ora, good evening everybody, I hope you're doing well. It is a cold and wet night and I thought I'd go live, why? Because I think I've got a pretty important message that I want to share with you this evening, which is emanating out of a post I did yesterday, but there's an article that I've come across tonight which kind of has awoken, I believe, the need to do this particular broadcast tonight. I could have waited until the Sunday roast tomorrow night, but I thought no, why? Because I'll record this tonight post it on YouTube, and then I can do the Sunday roast with a fresh perspective tomorrow night at 7pm. Alright, why the need to do a broadcast on a Saturday night? Welcome to you all, by the way. Kia ora tato, e hoa. My welcome, welcome to you, e hoa ma, my friends. It's good to see you, and I hope you're keeping warm and well and in good, and in good spirits. Okay, the title is a bit of an ominous title. New Zealand Intelligence Services at War with New Zealanders. Doesn't that sound pretty pretty, uh, pretty ominous? I think it does. Now, as you know, for a while, I've been talking about, about operations that, I've, that I know are being conducted against New Zealanders by not only the, the New Zealand police, but New Zealand Security Intelligence Services. And what I did was yesterday... I posted this, I posted this meme, I got this meme done, and when I had originally written it, it was really, really mentioning just COVID-19, but it's not, it's, it's, I failed to include the climate change issue because they are connected, and I want to read this to you, if you haven't seen it already, here is what it's about, this is, whole presentation tonight is about the state that we're living in and living with the state security services, the New Zealand government system, which has been weaponized day after day, hyper weaponized against the civil liberties and freedoms of New Zealanders. This is not a good thing at all. And this is what I wrote. It is increasingly evident to me as I research and investigate the COVID-19 and global dominance issues that New Zealand's security intelligence services are and have been ensconced in operations against New Zealand citizens to propagate COVID mis and disinformation, to surveil, harass, and perse- persecute dissenters, combat free speech, and manipulate mass public obedience to the New Zealand government's COVID and climate change narratives. The questions are why and under whose direction are they operating? The truth is coming, riveroflies.co.nz. Now, that's a pretty serious meme to put up there, and I thought about whether I should post something like that. But I posted this yesterday before I found the article that I'm going to share with you tonight, and it makes perfect sense why I would do this broadcast, and it justifies why I would make this meme and post it. One of the things I do want to share with you here, so you know that you know where I'm coming from, as all of you know, I've loved my country. I consider myself um, a patriotic New Zealander. I used to be the type of patriotic New Zealander that would fall over myself to want to serve the country, the government, the country, in any of the in any of the services that I've been in. I did my very best to do that. Okay, I, I wasn't meant to have careers in those areas, but I gave it my best shot. I went in there. To do my best to serve the community. Now, during the 2020 general election, when I was a candidate, when I was running, you know, I had lots of people question whether I had ever ever been in the army, whether I, I had done anything uh, like I claim to have done, such as attend the military intelligence courses uh, that I did, as well as um, you know having the background that I was sharing with you that I'm a researcher and that I know how to investigate issues, and I do. And that's why we've got this documentary coming. And what I wanted to share with you tonight, just briefly, is this uh, one of the course reports uh, here from my 2002, 14th of July, sorry, 14th of June, 2002, when I was on, let's read it, the, I'll read it to you, the Alpha 0610, Junior Intelligence Operator Course, 27th of May to the 14th of June, 2002, right? So this is the course report from the New Zealand Military Intelligence Corps introductory training that I did. And it was a fantastic 
a uh, few weeks that I spent on that course and I loved every bit of it. And the reason why I did that is that I really felt that I had the abilities to be a human intel or a human int operator. And that's the sort of person that would go into a combat theater where troops, our troops are operating or allied troops are operating. And I would go in and work with the, the local public uh, population to to gather intelligence and to win hearts and minds of the communities or the citizens of which we might be operating in their country. Okay, so that's where I saw myself. I p potentially saw myself as migrating from being a military intelligence operator into the civilian um, intelligence services. That's where I thought my interest was. And I sort of supplemented that course that I did then also uh, with a month-long tour of duty with the New Zealand Military Police Corps down in down in Trentham and Wellington. So I've got those got those kind of military areas there covered off and I've had a good look in them, etc. So I did those things and that can't be that cannot be argued with. And so I want to operate this broadcast, if you like, using that term operate, is I'm coming from a, the background where I understand what international threats and threats against um, our country could look, could look like. And I'm totally and remain committed to the idea, idea that every New Zealand citizen or permanent resident needs to play a role in protecting New Zealand against against foreign enemies, okay, against against threats, even domestic ones, right? So I'm okay with that and I'm across it. But it's predicated with the understanding that New Zealanders must have their civil liberties and their rights to free speech, their rights to opinions and beliefs without any overreach of, of the government or any military or police enforcement um, agency on behalf of the government. And I believe that for any government agency or intelligence agency or enforcement agency that reaches into the lives of New Zealanders and breaches privacy and rights to those freedoms, meant to be guaranteed under the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990, also the Human Rights Act, and also, of course, the UN, UN Convention. I don't believe I'm, I'm quoting them, but there is a convention there around human rights in the UN as well. And they're all sort of around that, uh, that premise that the rights of citizens to free speech, freedom of expression, protest are guaranteed and protected. Religious freedom as well, of course. So I'm, I, I want to just preface what I'm going to be presenting to you with that, is that I absolutely respect that there are some good men and women in enforcement agencies and in New Zealand security intelligence services. And I want to pay tribute to them because they do a tough job. But the problem is this, is that I believe that the New Zealand government, and it won't matter whether it's left or right, the team in red or the team in blue, I believe what they've done over a period of decades is is and has and have weaponized the New Zealand intelligence services, not only to deal with with uh, shall we say external external threats, but more so have been manipulated and uh, morphed into a, a a new version of itself where it is targeting you and me and New Zealanders that have a different opinion to the state. And that's a problem because when you have intelligence services, domestic intelligence services that are aiming at New Zealand citizens, anything is possible because they can rewrite laws uh, to, to frame you into being the enemy. And what are we seeing at the moment? We're seeing a lot of that. So... I just want to preface this presentation to say I am a patriotic uh, New Zealander. I'm a Christian pastor, former military police. Uh, I was even a support person in the voluntary fire brigade service. And I love our community. I love our people. But what I'm here to talk about tonight is of serious concern because it affects everyone, even the people who cannot see that this is happening. That, that think that New Zealand is just, the New Zealand government is just to be trusted and not questioned. 
I'm even wanting to speak up in defense of their rights of privacy because unfortunately, not everybody is awake to the stuff. And a boy, I tell you what, it's coming. People are going to get a rude awakening very, very shortly. One of the articles I want to start off is this one. Work begins on business case of potential new public media entity. A group of eight experts has been commissioned to work on a likely new public media entity the government has announced. Now, this has been shelved for now. Willie Jackson, the Minister for Broadcasting, tried to get this over the line, but it was halted, and it was around the idea of merging state media assets into one body, okay? And that didn't happen. Radio New Zealand, TV New Zealand, or Television New Zealand, they were going to merge, but no. But the problem is, that same minister who you're seeing there, Chris Farfoy, who's no longer a minister, he also, at the same time, was drafting bills such as, as the hate speech bill, online harm bill, all those sorts of things around uh, protecting, protecting the ears and the minds and the eyes of, of individuals against extremism. Fair enough. But the problem is, this is the problem, the way that they've written the laws is that they've created a straw man enemy that they can put any impose that character on anyone that doesn't agree with them. And that's when, and that's where we hit, we hit some, we hit some problems. We truly do. Now, the main areas that we are dealing with that are causing contention in New Zealand, what are they immediately? We know it, don't we? It's COVID-19 um, restrictions, COVID-19 tyranny and draconian laws, such as the COVID-19 Public Health Response Act. The most draconian law ever brought in, well, into the world and into New Zealand. I mean, let's face it, this is a, a law that allows anyone called an enforcement officer to be able to go into your private residence and pull you out without a warrant and perform a medical examination on you, i.e. the uh, the nasal swab, no relation, no relation, of course, to Klaus Schwab, up your nose to test you whether you want it or not for COVID-19. Now, when I first talked about that, people said, oh, you know, you're just... You're just, you're just a nut job conspiracy theorist. Well, where's the conspiracy now? Because that is in the New, the New Zealand COVID-19 Public Health Response Act 2020 and 2021 and 2022. It, and the New Zealand government promised that once they had established that 80,000 New Zealanders weren't going to die over a year, which is what Sean Hendy told New Zealanders, Professor Sean Hendy from Auckland University, that they would relinquish the the draconian power and authority of this unbelievable act. They said it would be an authority for two years. Okay, 2020, 2021, 2022, gone bigger. But no, it's still with us. And as I talked about on one of my podcasts a week or so ago, they've not only kept it, but they've strengthened it. They've strengthened the act's authority. And not only that, they've extended it themselves out to 2025. And they promised that by March 2023, they would look at getting rid of it. They haven't done it. So the areas of contention is around the loss of civil liberties around that, because now you've got this act, which means that that basically they can stop you from traveling. They can stop you from going places. They can stop you from congregating. They can do all sorts of horrible and nasty things to you. And this is and believe believe me, I take no joy out of um, out of saying any of this, I'm I'm horrified as I do this. Now, what they did was, or what happened with me in in early 2020, um, just as this Public Health Response Act, well, then a bill was being justified uh, by the New Zealand government to the New Zealand public, telling us that we've got to lock down. We need we need the we need the power and authority to lock us down. Otherwise, we're all going to die of COVID-19. Remember that? COVID-19 death fear, non-stop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But what had happened was <clears throat> I had released to me a military document. I had leaked to me a military document. This is it here. Now, I cover this document in the doc documentary. You'll notice up the top there 
it says restricted. This is a restricted document. Not quite top secret, but not far from it. It's a restricted document released by Joint Force Headquarters. Now, what this document talks about is the use of military in enforcement, COVID-19 enforcement roles, and intelligence gathering, and and knock, knock, knock on the door gathering, which is horrific. There's no way that we should be seeing New Zealand military used in those types of roles. I mean, we used to call them hearts and minds uh, roles, hearts and minds, where you'd win win the confidence of the population. But this is COVID-19, and they're going in, in the confines of this order for Operation Protect, is that military staff would be used in intelligence gathering. And so what would happen was, Military intelligence would work with civilian intelligence and also police intelligence together to coordinate coordinate um, intel and the dissemination of intel and the assessment of it, of course. Now, that's a problem in itself, in my view. I understand criminal or criminal um, intelligence. I mean, look at what we saw uh, during uh, Cyclone Gabriel. We had gang members you know, literally jumping in dinghies, rowing around flooded streets, ramsacking and looting shops and threatening people. Now, where was all of the action then? When were, where were the military, the police and the civilian intelligence uh, services? Where were they when this was going on? Because I've spoken uh, to people that were down there who have said that at that time during Cyclone Gabriel, these gang members were... were had carte blanche to to go around and do whatever they wanted. So there was a complete breakdown of, of law and order and these these criminal actions were able to be carried out. No sign of the police, no sign of military, no sign of any of that. Maybe we would have panicked if we'd seen the military, but maybe the military police police units could have been used in these roles as well. But anyway, my point is this. You've got the military assigned into dealing with COVID-19. Keep that in the back of your of your mind. Now, what I'm going to show you here is this article. And let's just get rid of that. Thank you very much. All right, let's just go here. Now, this is the article released today at 12.39 p.m. Now, I didn't see this in, this article until after sunset, until after Sabbath. And here it is here. Overarching National Intelligence and Security Agency, not far off, government says, I'm sorry, this man doesn't look doesn't look too good to me. Andrew Little. Let's read this. Setting up an overarching intelligence and security agency is a priority and is not far away, the government says. Now, we've already got that. We've already got that, GCSB. We've already got that. But anyway... It launched the country's first national security strategy yesterday, as well as a revised defense strategy. Now, I covered that the other night, and you heard Rebecca Kitteridge saying that the enemies that they're facing include international competitiveness, international competitiveness, and then she went on to say misinformation, extremism, and well, in particular, right wing extremism. Hmm. So that's that's segregating a whole bunch of New Zealanders right there out. Misinformation, extremism, climate change, and future pandemics. That's a real big problem because all of those are part of those two branches of concern I've said and talked about for ages that are a big worry for New Zealand civil liberties. Why? Because you've got COVID 19 over here. You've got pandemics over here. You've got um, climate change over here. And these these things are going to be knitted together as areas to justify problem, reaction, solution, justify control over the free speech and free expression of New Zealanders. Because what they're going to say, if you stand up and speak up against these things, you are a, a domestic threat. It's unbelievable, but that's the fact. Listen to this. Muslims, Muslim and Jewish community groups have previously expressed frustration at how long it had taken. Skepticism at other structural changes that were already taking place when they believed the NSA should have directed these 
and doubt that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet would actually relinquish its premier role in national security. All right, let's get down to a better bit here. The Federation of Islamic Association today said setting it up would make the country safer. Now, now I want to be upfront about this. I've got Muslim friends, and I respect them. They're very committed people. I was really good friends with a, with a Muslim man that I worked with at a company. Him and I used to have our lunch together. He didn't have many, many friends, so I used to go and sit with him. And he was an awesome, awesome, lovely man. And so I've got nothing against the Muslim people. But we must remember that most of these people come from Sharia backgrounds. And so the Sharia background and the Sharia appreciation of civil liberties is not the same as what you and I have. You must keep this in mind because that's really important because the New Zealand Domestic Security Intelligence Services should always be operating with the values and the beliefs of New Zealanders, not foreign people, not people born in foreign countries that come here and bring their cultural identity with them. Not saying their cultural identities are wrong, but New Zealand should be governed with New Zealand values. Do you understand where, where I'm coming from there? It's not to be elitist, exclusive, racist, or culturally segregative, not at all. But it's about making sure that New Zealand, the way that we are governed, is governed with New Zealand values not those that are that we have no cultural affinity with and we may not, frankly, even want in our country. All right, let's go back here. All right, so what else? Are going, so they're developing this strategy, so they're going to do this. Now listen to this. This is, this is where we, we, we hit, the, uh, hit the, uh, the hot spot here. Andrew Little said, these reforms will ensure we have the right structures and, range, and, and arrangements in place to deliver a more strategic approach. So, so far, we've heard, really, it's about um, Muslims and Jewish family. Well, okay, let's go back up here a bit more. It says that, that the whole point of the establishment of the, of the number two priority of the Royal Commission of the National Intelligence Security Agency, they were keen to see the agency as part of the machinery of government but maintaining independence. Two, as the Royal Commission had recommended, Razak said, "This is, this is a bit, this is a bit out there, isn't it? This is really sounding a bit strange. I didn't got down that far, because now this man Razak, who's the Federation of Islamic Association president, is commenting on this. So he's saying that it's about maintaining independence. Razak said, so what?" Now, I've got to ask the question that you might be wanting to ask there. Why do we have the president of the, of the National Muslim Association New Zealand being read into, into the whys and the hows and the, and the whos of the new national security strategy? I find that a bit strange. I absolutely believe if we have parts of our community that have been targeted by hate, of course, they've got to be worked with. But this is a little bit too uncomfortable for my liking. All right, let's go. He may has made, let's see, all right, so he has made repeated reports, this is this is Razak, developed on behalf of the Muslim community to Little. Eight, that he was working through, Little joked at the launch about improving the security system to prevent a repeat of terrorist violence. We've had one event in New Zealand since 2018. Well, since just about forever. One event. They're trying to say that that man that stabbed those people in, I think it was Linmore or out west at that west, uh, west Auckland shopping mall, they're trying to make out that he's a terrorist, that he's a terrorist. Well, he can't have been a very good one, quite frankly, because he, had, he was armed with a knife and he went, it, it sounds like that he was mentally unwell, he had a beef and that's how he expressed himself. He was nuts. And he committed those ghastly crimes and tried to harm people. All right. So that's quite a bit different to someone amping up himself with a whole bunch of rifles and going out and killing a lot of people, chanting a, chanting a mantra while he's doing it. It's a lot different. Or someone strapping on a whole bunch of grenades on themselves, walking into some a movie theater and pulling all the pins out. That's a completely different thing. But this is very, very, very strange. They're talking about a repeat of terrorist violence, one terrorist event, one too many, but one, and I'm going to show you an article soon 
that's going to probably make your no your nose your, your <laughs> your nose, your nose, your nose flare up. Anyway, in the list, this is now uh, Andrew Little is talking. Over the next two years, government will deliver a program of national security reform, in line with the Royal Commission's emphasis on collective accountabilities and national security community leadership. These reforms will ensure we have the right structures and, arrange and arrangements in place to deliver a more strategic approach. Fair enough. Little said it was the first time the country had had a strategy and the first time the public was being given such visibility of what was going on. The 12 core issues that mostly impact on our national security interests were listed as, listen, strategic competition and rules and the rules-based international system, emerging critical and sensitive technologies. All right, we're going to unpack these better in a second. Disinformation. Aha. Uh -huh. Now we're in it. Foreign interference and espionage. Okay. Terrorism and violent extremism. We're going to unpack these. Transnational organized crime. I get it. Economic security. Pacific resilience and security. Maritime security. Border security. Cyber security. Space security. Okay. All right then. Let's look at a couple of these. Let's look at the emerging critical and sensitive technologies. Well. Let's, let's have a look at this for a second. The vaccine passport is the next digital ID card. It's the introdu introduction of China's surveillance system into free Western societies. Anybody who pushes these passports as a good idea is trying to destroy liberal democracy and replace it with totalitarian, totalitarian communism. And she's absolutely right. Well done, Emerald. And so what you have here, and this is, this is, the, this is the worry here, is we have got this new system, this new focus, if you like, which is now saying that it's talking about wanting to protect emerging critical and sensitive technologies. Well, that's a bit of an issue when you know that we are confronted with central bank digital currencies, right? All those sorts of information technology things around your um, data privacy, yeah, I get it. They need to be protected. But what if, what if the state approves new technology that restricts your freedom and civil liberties and freedom of expression and freedom of speech. What about that? It's a good question to ask. Okay, next one on the list, disinformation. Well, what sort of disinformation are we talking about here? Are we talking about COVID disinformation? Are we talking about whether prime ministers or ministers are involved in conversations that they shouldn't be, and then talking about that, are we talking about climate change denial or climate change disinformation or misinformation? What are we talking about here? Who are the targets of propagating disinformation? Who are they? Who are these people? We're going to identify them in a minute, and I think that's where your, your nostrils are going to flare up. What else have we got? Foreign interference and espionage. Now, you will remember during the Wellington protest down in Wellington at Parliament when, when thousands of New Zealanders, policemen, doctors, lawyers, nurses, educators, engineers, mechanics, farmers, mothers, daughters, grandmothers, fathers, husbands, unemployed, wealthy people, everyone turned up to say, we are concerned about losing our civil liberties, losing our jobs through a mandate that no longer make, didn't make sense then, and we now know had no justification, none at all. And so we know that when those people turned up to, to um, fight the fight for freedom, what did the New Zealand mainstream media do? What did they do? They immediately said that everybody was there because we'd all been influenced. All of us had been influenced, even though I wasn't there. I was there in heart, mind, and via camera. That everybody was there because of Russian misinformation. Do you rem remember that? Russian misinformation. That's a really important thing to keep in mind. Because what they're now trying to do, they are trying to, to associate our concerns about our civil liberties with foreign interference. They're associating the two. 
even though the two are far apart. Now, the, what the mainstream media did with me, they tried to say that I was a QAnon guy, I was a QAnon politician, and I was a Trumpite, um, a, a Trump supporter. Nothing could have been further from the truth. I never mentioned Q, I don't think, in any ever of my of my speeches or any of my rhetoric at all. Why? Because I've never trusted it. I've never trusted it. To me, Q bears all of the signs of a CIA operation, without doubt. The Trump thing, again, I wasn't sure about him. Once Operation Warp Speed came out, that was it for Trump for me. And and so I was always concerned with our scene here. Our scene here, I was always concerned with New Zealand's well-being, period. So what the media has done, and this is why they were so keen to merge state media together and create the New Zealand Public Interest Journalism Fund, is where they where and and they could push out this idea that anybody who challenged the government in any in any area was a spreader of misinformation, disinformation, and was a dissident and was a and what's that favorite word that they like to call us? A conspiracy theorist. To divert us away from the real core issues. Never debating the core issues of concern, but slandering you. So you can see where this is going. They're talking about terrorism and violent extremism. Let me say that again. Terrorism and violent extremism. Now that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Because what you've got here, what you've got here is you've got the New Zealand government redefined the meaning of domestic terror. They redefined it to being someone not just out there to cause mass murder and terror, to being someone that that causes public fear. Do you understand that, what that means? That means they can redefine me speaking like this as an act of terror. That's what we're dealing with right now. This is not a future thing. This is a right now issue. And when you look in light of what this what this document says and what this article says here is that they're talking about terrorism and violent extremism. But who are the violent extremists? Who are they? Is it the gang members roaming the streets every day, people getting shot in the head and dying? I, I would call them violent extremists. What are they doing about that? Very little. Very little, Andrew Little. And so terrorism and violent extremism that's another worry because they can they can redefine that. All the rest of that other stuff I kind of I kind of expect and would expect of a security intelligence agency. Right? I totally get that. So we've now looked at what they're wanting to do. But one of the problems is, and an, another problem here we have in New Zealand is this. Senior ex US military officers land New Zealand government jobs. Now, what this is, they are purposely, the New Zealand government is recruiting foreign, foreign military or ex-foreign military officers into New Zealand intelligence roles. That's a problem, folks. That's a beef right there. And why is that? Why is that? Because like I said earlier, we want people to govern and to protect and look after New Zealand with New Zealand's principles and values that we traditionally have here in New Zealand. And I don't care whether the, the former military man is an American or an Englishman or what have you. I, I even wondered whether it was always the right thing whether we had all these English police come over. When I went through police college, we had the, I think it was the first wing of former UK uh, police officers go through as well and a wing on almost on their own. And so I've got a bit of a beef with that because who are these people? Are they ex-CIA? Are they ex-NSA? Um, what are they? What, what, is, what is their background? We already know that the New Zealand police has been training and exchanging um, training protocols and training concepts 
with the Hong Kong police force, who has a brutal history of cracking down on libertarians in Hong Kong, fighting for civil rights, fighting for freedom. We know that the reports are there that the Hong Kong police force were using torture techniques. They had informers in Hong Kong society ratting out people that were civil liberty activists. And so my problem is with that is what level of accountability has our recruitment team at any of these enforcement or uh, intelligence service agencies, what level of, of process do they put these people in? Have they got a, a, sorry, not suitable threshold? These are the things that we need to, need to, we need to ask ourselves. And by the way, they're recruiting that, they're recruiting that right now. So I want to I want to play this to you. You're going to have a little bit of a laugh for a second, but this is not that funny. But you're going to get it. It's funny, but it's not funny if you know what I mean. Have a look at this because this is from the New Zealand uh, police police's Facebook page, and it's about recruiting uh, for the um, for the New Zealand intelligence area. Have a look at this. Can you keep a secret? Do you want to help protect New Zealand's national security? Today, I'm meeting Andrea, who's going to introduce me to the New Zealand intelligence community. She's a spy. I'm not a spy. I'm an HR. Why is your face all blurred out? My identity is secret. We focus on counter-terrorism, respond to cyber attacks, keep an eye on foreign agents, and what is happening internationally. Our mission is to keep New Zealand and New Zealanders safe. We're recruiting now. We need all kinds of everyday people who want to make a difference. People from a variety of backgrounds and technical expertise so that we can deal with the range of security challenges that we face. So, you need people like me? Uh, maybe. We need analytical minds, people ready to learn and develop an amazing career. People who are focused and alert. Targets at 10 o'clock. Get a photo of who he passes those documents to. Roger, copy that. Roger that. Okay for a first training run. Man, that was intense. How do you do it? Because everything's confidential, we can't bring work home. The work-life balance is great. Mm, I suppose. <laughs> You're looking a bit fuzzy, Andrea. Oh, yeah, I think I've caught a bit of a cold. COVID. My job's a secret. Right. Right. So do you want to join us? Do you want your work to make a difference? I'd like to make a difference. You're definitely different. Is that your real voice? Nope. Good lip sync. Can you see my lips? All right, so there you go. So it's got here, Government Communication Security Bureau, which is your GCSB, New Zealand Security Intelligence Service, New Zealand Government. Of course, the Rainbow Tick Certified. Rainbow Tick Certified? How woke can you get? Now, so I want to say right now, I've experienced all of that. I have been surveilled. I have been followed. I have been photographed. I have been listened to. I have been bugged. And I am watched right now as I do this presentation by New Zealand Security, Security Intelligence Services and also by the New Zealand Police Intelligence Section right now and i say shame on you all have a deep deep look at yourself because i stand for the right i stand for the good thing i stand for all of the good things that most new zealanders want to see happen 
And so if you're watching this and recording me, which I know you are, then you need to take a really good blinking look. Because you know what? I would still defend my country if I was called upon to do it. Maybe as an army military chaplain, maybe that's where I'd be, rather than as a soldier. But I'd still play my role. And so what we are seeing here is really not good at all. But I want to point out, I've been through all of what they're talking about. I've had people follow me. I even, here, this, is, this, is, this will show you how it's not good. I was having a meeting with a policeman about who I work with closely about my protests. He was a member of the police intelligence unit. And I got really friendly with him. And I don't know if the name was was his real name. I don't know that. I know he's a member of the police. No problem. And so I sat, talked to him about what we were doing with our, our protests. No problem. That was all straight up and down. One day I was talking to him. And we were talking about some pretty personal things. Nothing to do with protests, but rather about Fano. And he looked at me and goes, look, I've got to go. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, the scene, the look here, where we are right now, doesn't look right. He says, I'll go, I'll ring you later. He gets up and goes. And you know what? He was right. Because when he left, I watched certain people in the room, and then they left. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. But I know that after the election, on election night, I went back to my hotel, and when I walked in through the door of the hotel, after on, this is election night, I had a guy come up to me and go, Billy, Billy, can I have a photo with you? And without thinking, I went up to him and allowed this guy to take a photo of me. And then it dawned on me, that guy was an intelligence agent, an operator. Why would I think that? Because he had taken a photo in such a way, and I watched him, because I knew the alarm bells went on. As soon as I'd done it, I walked five feet and I turned around, and a black car pulled up. He jumped in, gone burger. So this is what's happening. I am a private New Zealand citizen. I have no criminal record other than apparently being a COVID dissident. And I care about my country and I'm a I'm a pacifist, really. That's the reality of it. So that's not a that's not a good thing at all. That's what they're doing. But let's look at who they they are identifying as being extreme as extremists and people of risk. Let's look at this. This is of course Rebecca Kitteridge former Director General of the NZSIS. So um, just to be clear, we were looking at white identity extremism before March the 15th, 2019, but yes, there has been an increase uh, as, uh, in terms of that kind of uh, uh, ideology, which is of concern. If it was 50-50, what did it used to be? So we, d we have been um, investigating it previously. Uh, it was less than that before now, obviously. Um, no, the, the, of course, uh, we were looking at the issues to do with white identity extremism before the March 15th attacks, um, and we've continued to do that, but we do see that uh, ideology as increasing, which is of concern. Okay, right. So white extremism, white identity extremism. Now, what did we have recently? We had Marama Davidson, Green Party co-leader, say that all the violence in New Zealand, or in the world rather, was coming from white cisgender men. Remember that? So are we seeing a connection between leftist ideology spilling over into New Zealand intelligence uh, service areas as well? I think so, we are. And to confirm it, let's look at this one here, because this one, again, don't forget, she just said it's white identity extremism. Man, I tell you. Let's not forget this beauty here, because this is this is this is Kate Hanna from the Dis Disinformation Project, who was funded with taxpayer money to say the following. You can draw people in in lots of different places. And each of the platforms are used in different ways. Hello, friends. As you can see, I'm working on my wig. Be back. What is known internationally as the kind of trad wife set of viewpoints, which is white Christian, a lot of pseudo Celtic, pseudo Nordic ideology. So white, white Christian woman, white Christian woman. Let's just get that bit again. 
internationally as a kind of trad wife set it's of viewpoints, which is white Christian, a lot of pseudo. So who are the targets to be aware of? White Christian people. Okay, let's continue. Celtic pseudo Nordic ideologies behind it. They use Pinterest and Instagram to draw in other women who are interested in interior design, children's clothing, knitting, healthy food for children. And it does draw people in towards a set of white nationalist ideas. I mean, it's really so white nationalist ideas. So white Christian women who have a leaning to want to um, feed their kids nice food and like to knit have a set of white nationalist values. Okay, let's keep going. Relatively easy to see. If you see a very beautiful, fair-skinned... Notice the dark music now. When she starts talking about beautiful children, here comes the dark music. Listen to that. Bond or red-haired child with beautiful braiding in her hair and some flowers just step back a little bit <laughs> which is really distressing because that's my heritage she is nuttier than a bag of peanut slabs this woman and yet she's put it out there for us she has she's put it out there for us she's told you who the problem children are so on one hand you've got the director of former director of the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service saying that it's white extremists, white national extremists, then you've identity extremists. Now you've got white Christian women who uh, have a set of white nationalist values. Good grief. But what is what is the primer? What is the primer that identifies these these threats, what is it? It's people that do not agree with the government. And we have a left-wing government now. Believe me, it's not going to be different when it goes to Luxon. This is, this is the game. It will not change. It's going to come from the right next. You watch. Civil liberties will still be eradicated, but coming from, coming from the other side. This is not about left and right politics. The sooner we get our minds across that, the sooner we will understand what we're dealing with. So you've got these you've got these white women saying that other white Pakia people, white people, are the problem children here. Well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Now down in Wellington, they're saying that everybody down there has been influenced by Russian misinformation and disinformation. Then they're saying everybody is a white separatist. They even went so far to say that all of the Māori people down there in Pōneke, in Wellington, that the indigenous people of New Zealand, Aotearoa, that were protesting there, had been fooled and were working with white supremacists. Arne, there you go. There you have it. That they even try and say that Māori people who know what's going on and can see the erosion of, of civil liberties and freedoms and, uh, and a free society in New Zealand, suddenly, we can't think for ourselves either. Māori people, we can't think, it, think for ourselves either. Now, we've got to be influenced and being suckered in by white nationalism. So, do you, do you get what I'm trying to say here? I'll, do, I'll, I'll put it all into a, nice, into a nice package soon for us to understand this, because this is, this is not good. So, you've seen... That it's white supremacists and white women who are Christian women, who have trad, housewife, motherly desires, they are the problem. Why? It's everybody who disagrees with the government, with left-wing politics of wokeism, cancel culture, loss of rights and freedoms, COVID, climate change, all of that. Identity politics, you should be allowed to sexualize your children, not allowed to talk to them about gender dysphoria. And look, look at this. This is the latest one. This is Know the Signs campaign. NZSIS released its first ever guide to help identify signs of violent extremism. What is it about? This guide is about this. It is about a citizen informer program. Very similar to what the Nazis had. Very similar to what the secret police in Soviet society had. They had exactly this. 
Obama tried to do it in America, it went nowhere. They're doing it here, and they have done since October. There is now a hotline direct to the hot desk dealing with domestic threats. And now, if somebody hears Billy speaking, and I'm saying I've got real concerns that the COVID-19 narrative is, is dishonest, fake, and that the Public Health Response Act for COVID-19 is tyrannical, it's, it's deadly, it's harming us, and all that, somebody could hear me and go, that Billy, he doesn't like the government. And he, he, might, he just might plan a domestic terror event. But don't forget, in the new definition of domestic terror, it's now somebody who creates fear. And so what you have is, and then the, you know, someone down at the hotline desk says, well, uh, were you scared? Yes. Well, you've, been, you've, been, you've, had, you've had fear generated in you. That Billy Te- Tekahika is creating fear. So he's a target. So this Know the Signs campaign is real. And they tell you this. I couldn't find the particular TV article I wanted. But they tell you that if you hear people talking about COVID-19 dissidents, you are to report them if you think it's off. That's a real problem. Violent extremism. But let's not forget that violence in their world, they've redefined violence to mean to mean people who don't agree with them and who speak words of disagreement and dissidence. That is now violence. But what about this? We're drumming that messaging around the dangers of COVID pretty diligently for a full two-week period of sustained propaganda. 1st of March 2021. Jacinda Ardern said it herself. So when I pick up on the fact that they're using propaganda and I turn up and say, why if we are in a deadly, the deadliest uh, pandemic since Spanish flu, why have we got propaganda? Where is the science? Then somebody can say, Billy, you are an extremist. Can't really call me a white supremacist because I'm clearly I'm not. But that's the problem. But who's the spreading? Who is the spreader of mis and disinformation? We'll look at that to finish in a second. So we've got real problems here. What about this? What about COVID vaccines, etc.? What about these guys? Is this considered foreign influence on New Zealand? Because both of these men have influenced our Prime Ministers to and continue to do so. Both of them are. How many photos have we got of Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates with Jacinda Ardern? How many photos have we got with Jacinda Ardern with Klaus Schwab? Now Chris Hipkins with Klaus Schwab. And these are real quotes from Bill Gates. COVID-19 vaccines should give us extreme control over the population worldwide. Quote circa 2021. The COVID-19 outbreak is the first big step towards unprecedented control over mankind. And he's, he, has, he has said various versions of that so often. You don't, have, you don't have to pick a year where this has been said. He said it in 2020. He wrote a book talking about COVID-19 being the great opportunity to reshape the world into his new version of a global dystopian stakeholder economy of the fourth industrial reset a revolution and the great reset of the fourth Reich. this is bizarre it's truly truly bizarre and we better we better understand all of these things because this is not good this is not good at all i want to show you this here and i'm going to start to put it into into a summary for you i am friends with with a very very strong beautiful Jewish freedom fighter. Her name is Dr. Rima Laibo. She herself is friends with many, many Jewish freedom fighters that think just like you and me in the in regards to these issues. And she is friends with another lady who's done a great documentary, Never Again. And it's about, you know, what did they say back in the day? Never again will there be Will there be the yellow stars of anti-Semitism and of segregation, of apartheid? 
But what did they do with the vaccine passport? They did exactly that. What did they do with the face mask? They did exactly that. They took away human dignity and replaced it for signs of, of compliance and strict obedience. But I believe that this beautiful Jewish lady here says it the right way. I escaped the Nazis once. You will not defeat me now. And I think that's a very wise and impressive statement there. Because they know anyone that has lived in the Soviet um, Eastern Europe bloc that I've met have said to me, what the heck is wrong with New Zealanders? We came here to escape um, fascism, communism. We came to New Zealand to escape totalitarianism. And New Zealanders are sleeping right through it as the, as the, as the prison house of tyranny has been built in front of us. This is what we are dealing with. And they say, what is wrong with you, New Zealanders? What is wrong with you? Why can't we all see what's going on here? The fact is this, my dear friends. I believe that New Zealand is at the head of the queue. I've been saying it for a long time. That we are at the very head of the queue to lose our rights and freedoms as they hand out the tyranny lollies. I really do. I don't believe the National Party are going to be anything different to these guys in red, except you're going to get them behaving in the way that a so-called centre-right political party will behave, but they will still undermine civil liberties in New Zealand. Now, what I want to suggest is that we set up a People's Accountability Commission for, for the intelligence community. I believe that we as New Zealanders need to set up an independent, independent National Security Transparency Commission, or whatever we call it, to be able to interface with these government agencies to make sure that they are accountable, that they're transparent. Now, they're saying, well, we're going to be independent of the government. That's, an, a, that's a problem in itself as well. That's a potential big problem as well. Why is that? Because if they're too independent, can they themselves be working un unaccountable and working with foreign influence? I absolutely believe that's possible. And when they're saying, well, it's a good thing we've been independent, no, it's not. Not without, not without public um, officers that are working on behalf of New Zealand people to keep the intelligence, intelligence communities, uh, agencies reined in. Because what they're doing right now is unbelievable. What they're planning to do, what's coming down the pipeline at us, is is simply indecent and disgusting. And it's going to affect everybody in New Zealand. And what they're doing right now, by the way, they haven't gone live with it yet. But this new regulator that's coming out, he's going to basically say what you're allowed to say and approve it, films, movies, newspapers, print media, online. The new, the new head of that commission is the former... Deputy Director General of, of Health for New Zealand, who brought in all of the control measures for COVID-19. So how does that woman go from there to now working in the area of regulating everything you're allowed to say online and beyond? How does that work? The New Zealand government has put their stooge puppet into that role so that they will absolutely be able to do exactly what, what Hitler did as he worked with Josef Goebel to control all media in Germany. That's how they did it. It's exactly how they did it. They worked in the schools. They worked in the universities. They controlled all of the newspapers. And what they did was, with a lot of the newspaper owners that didn't want to work with the Nazis, they just put a bullet in their head. And they ended up controlling every aspect of propaganda and media in Germany, which is how ordinary Germans became so hostile towards the Jewish family and how they became ramped up, ready for war, and how many of them ended up committing heinous crimes in World War II and before World War II. So the purpose of this broadcast, family, is not to alarm us, but to educate us 
as to what's happening here. We've got to be able to calmly piece it together. Now, I cover a good portion of, of this stuff in the documentary, the riveroflies.co.nz in the third episode. And I want to report that next week, next week we would have f- f- finished episode one. And that enough, it's going to be just under two hours when we finished. It's a bit longer than I thought, but the next ones will be 90 and 90. But this one here, episode one, is going to be enough to make you go, we have been, we have been manipulated, we've been lied to, blah de blah de blah But the thing is this, is that we're not telling you what to think. We're going to go, here's the evidence. You look at it. Does it make sense to you? Does it seem honest? Does it seem plausible that the government was working in your best interest? Because I would like to table. My own personal view is this, is that at the very, very least, they were criminally negligent and and practiced medical uh, malfeasance. And down the other end of it, that they were just criminal and committed crimes against New Zealand society. So I want to advocate again Please support the documentary, riveroflies.co.nz. Go to the website. Please donate to it and help us to finish it. We've got a long way to go. We've got no money left and we need help to do it. That's not why I've done tonight. When I saw that article tonight, by the way, with Andrew Little on it, talking about this new overarching structure that they're setting up for, for New Zealand security intelligence, you know, it really, it, it really stung me. And I thought, man, I've got to talk about this. I'm going to put this on YouTube because what we are dealing with in New Zealand is deeply serious. They are rolling the same campaign out in lockstep all around the world right now. Even Russia has got their uh, central bank digital currency ready to go. Even Putin. I've never trusted Putin. I don't think him and Zelensky are, are, are enemies with each other, quite frankly. That's another tale. So anyway, keep the peace in your spirit. Acknowledge these things. Expose them. The Bible says, you know, have no fellowship with darkness, but rather reprove and expose the unfruitful works of of evil. Do it. That's why I do this, is that we bring it all together. We expose it and say, there you are. We know what you're doing. Please share this important broadcast tonight. I'm going to put it straight onto YouTube. Please get this message out there because this affects every New Zealander, left or right, doesn't matter. Because what will happen is when the team in the in blue get in, suddenly the people on the left, they're going to be the ones on the outer. You watch, and that's how it works. That's exactly how it works. All right, family, I will see you on Sunday at 7 p.m. on the Major Dyke Sunday Roast Show. And please come and tune in for that. We'll go over some of the stuff and daily items as well. But through all of this, keep the peace. Keep the peace in your spirit. And please seek the Lord while he can be found. If you'd like to reach out to me, please do so at my email, Billy. It's on the bottom here. Billy at ibc.net.nz. Billy at ibc.net.nz. Take care, everybody. And remember to keep the faith. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Pray for those who despitefully use, hurt and persecute you. All right, people. Thank you so much. Pumarie and good night.